and welcome to Narayana IS Academy. In this session of the top topics of the week, we'll delve into five most important topics from the Hindu and the Indian Express. So let's explore each topic in depth so that you're well informed and prepared for the examination. So let's kick off with the first topic. Let's get started with the first article that is related to Russia. Now, what is the context? We are saying Russia is changing its foreign policy. Earlier, Russia used to focus more on the European region. And nowadays, Russia is focusing more on the Asia. They want to depend more on Asia rather than Europe. And this is happening because of the geopolitical changes. This terminology is very important. Geopolitical. Now, many students do not know what is geopolitics. If I have to say it simply, it is said that the foreign policy of a country can be decided by the geography of that country. It is said that if you know the geography of a country, then you can definitely tell what the international forums, international countries, other countries are going to have foreign policy towards that country. Let's say, for example, if you are having geography where there are so many minerals, where you have natural gas, or maybe you are having oil. So if I am talking about the Gulf region, where there is oil field, where there is natural gas, you will see that most of the countries around the world will be more interested in this region. That's why you see the politics that goes on around the Gulf region or the Middle East is very much complex. So we are saying the politics depends on the geography. And now we are saying this geopolitical landscape itself is changing. What do I mean by that? I am trying to say that the geopolitical equations that were existing earlier, now they are changing. So first we need to know what kind of relations, what kind of equations earlier used to exist. So if we go back to the history and we th think about the time period of World War II, if you remember the period of 1945, after the World War II, you observe there were only two countries who were considered as the most powerful or the superpowers. That is USA and another is USSR. These are the two countries. Now you observe that the politics that was going on throughout the world, the geopolitics which you call, that was only surrounding these two countries. That's why we call the time period as a bipolar time period where there are only two poles. One pole is USA, another one is USSR. And this was happening till the time of 1991. Now you observe that by the time of 1991, USSR disintegrated. And we observed that there was only one superpower in the world and that was United States of America. Now we are saying that the world politics is being shaped by the foreign policy of United States of America. Even we saw that India became part of WTO. We brought some amendments in our constitution which talks uh, talk about democratic decentralization. Democratic decentralization. Before that, we brought LPG policy. All of these events depend on the world geopolitics. So we are saying in this time period, now moving ahead from 1991 till 2000. This is the time period in which we are saying that USA was the dominating country. Now, after some time, we observe that, that is after 2000 specifically, we observe that in the world, the USA's power was declining. And when we say USA, we also talk about all the Western countries. All the Western countries are led by USA. So in Western countries, you can talk about UK, Germany, France, all these countries. Now, because USA's power is declining, now when I say power, it is related to your economy also. If you are not economically good, we cannot say you are powerful enough. And at the same time, we are observing some other countries in the other part of the world, they were doing better. For example, you can talk about China. China has go grown exponentially. Even India has grown in a very good manner since 1991 reforms. So right now what is happening? Right now, there is a shift in the geopolitics 
where in the power is not concentrated in the hands of usa or western countries but now it is shifting towards asian countries which includes china india and some other countries which even we can say even russia is part of it and now there are some tensions started since the war of ukraine so russia ukraine war which started just one year back 2022 since that time we are observing that russia which was earlier very much interested having very much interested in having good relations with the european countries is now thinking about recalibrating its policies they are changing their policies and now they want to focus more on asia and when i say asia it means china as well as india now as far as we are concerned we are more interested in knowing what it will have impact on india russia relations but before that let's have a brief understanding of why this is happening why russia is looking towards asia first reason is the sanction we saw that when this war started russian invasion of ukraine or russia ukraine war it started after that all the western countries have started putting some sanction on russia sanctions means they will say that you will not have access to our market they will not give access to the technologies so for example there was one thing called swift this was a mes messaging system related to the payment which takes place throughout the world let's say for example you are buying something from russia you have to make payment russia is selling something to let's say america there the payment has to be taken place for all those payment when messaging system was there and that was named as swift but after this war what happened russia was taken out from all of these systems many sanctions were there put on russia now because of this what is happening russia has become alone russia has become isolated now when you become isolated there is no private investment coming to your country from western countries nobody is coming to you you will try to find new partners so you are now looking at china and india because anyway china and india are growing they are emerging economies they are going to grow and there is nothing wrong for russia to move towards china and india when it comes to economy specifically then they too want to diversify their economic sector now russia is very much dependent to some extent on the defense production to some extent on the energy production we know that russia sells us energy and since the war has started india has been one of the largest buyer of russian oil nobody is buying russian oil india said we will buy there is benefit for for india there is benefit for russia for russia there is no customer so russia is finding it good that there is one customer for india it is beneficial because we are getting the oil in a discounted price especially when there is so much instability and uncertainty in the world we don't know somewhere in israel there is war going on some day we will see some other war going on in another part of the world so there is uncertainty in the world and whenever there is uncertainty there is chance of disruption of supply chain there is a possibility the oil which comes to our country that supply can be disrupted and if the supply is disrupted what will happen you do not get the supply of oil suddenly the demand of oil will increase and suddenly the price of oil will increase and that is not good for our economy because if you have very high priced oil then you will see all other products their price will also increase so it is beneficial for both countries but if you are looking at simply at russia they are more interested in diversifying their economy and third is the strategic alliance when we say the word strategic it means a country is planning on a long term basis they are thinking for let's say 10 years 15 years 20 years they are thinking that even if Russia is right now little bit dependent on Europe or or let's say America or any other country they are thinking about a broader plan in next 10 15 20 years what will happen the world will be dominated much by china it will be dominated to some extent by india also it's not only usa who is going to lead the world so in that case if if you have really good alliance with china and india that is going to benefit russia in a very good manner so this is the reason why there is change in the politics geopolitics now moving ahead let's discuss about the india russia relations now this is the section which matters to us now first of all almost everyone knows that india russia relations 
are growing since the time of independence right india russia relationship is said to be time tested relationship and right now if you see the most important part of our relationship is the defense sector you see since 1947 till now the maximum defense import that india has done you have bought some kind of a equipment let's say some artillery you have bought s400 you have bought if you look at all of these things we buy maximum defense related equipments from russia then other countries are there and right now we are also buying from other countries let's say we are buying from france from usa from israel but still we see that maximum products come from russia so we have a really good partnership when it comes to defense sector but india is thinking or russia is thinking that we will not only stick to this part we will diversify we will have relationship which is relatively broader okay second if you look at the trade now earlier there was trade but right now since the war has started we are observing india russia trade relations have increased for example this data you must know that in 2022 june there was 3.5 billion us dollar this was the bilateral trade between india and russia and by the time of 2024 may it has become 7.5 billion so it has increased two times and maybe even it will increase further this shows that india russia trade relations are growing that's for sure then third thing if you specifically talk about the energy partnership see the country like india who has got uh, a big demography we have 140 crore population and this population requires energy security we need oil we need natural gas because of that energy we can sustain our economy let's say suddenly the supply of crude oil stops do you think our economy can grow in the manner in which it is growing right now it is not possible so we need that supply and we have a good partner who can help us right now so we are interested in this relationship and there is angle of strategic dialogue strategic again i said the long term dialogue that are taking place so many times you must have observed some high level meetings taking place between india and russia so uh, president putin meeting prime minister modi and in those meetings some targets are set for the bilateral relations for example a target was set that we will increase our trade to 100 billion dollar by the year 2030 now this is an ambitious target but please understand when both countries are agreeing that we are going to have this target that means they are building up their relation in a strategic manner so this kind of a relationship we are having or we are building with russia okay i hope you got it now before moving ahead let me check some comments if there is any question good evening very important topic okay no question let's move ahead now in this relationship or in this geopolitical changes or shift in the geopolitical arena what kind of challenges india and russia may face in building their relationship first is the self reliance policies see india is having the policy of make in india you will observe similar kind of policy in russia also they call it industrial nationalism sometimes this term is used by scholars that russia also wants that maximum industries should work in russia they should have their manufacturing base in russia and right now because of this russia ukraine war and these sanctions there is no investment coming to russia so russia will be also feeling that we should have this nationalist policy self reliance policy so there is a chance that if they want to build their self reliance we want to build our self reliance how can we collaborate so this is a big challenge which we need to tackle the second issue that we will have is limited areas of high value trade now if you look at the trade which takes place between india and russia there is a problem we do not have a trade which is having broad products we have only few products that to specifically consumer goods let's say we are having we are exporting textile products to russia we are exporting pharmaceutical products to russia but can you think about some high end value goods when we say high end value goods you can think about some computers some machineries or let's say the kind of products we build let's say this electronic goods automotive components it products it services india is good at it services 
but we are not selling those things to Russia. So that means there is some disconnection when it comes to our trade. We are not dealing in high value trade goods. We are only dealing with smaller products. Okay. Then there is problem of logistics. Now see, if you look at the map, we have India. Let's say this is, this is the map of India. Here you will find China. Here you will find Russia. Now the problem is, there is no direct route through which India and Russia can access each other's market. There is no direct route available. And because of which, it is very difficult to increase our trade relations. Now, here we are already working on a project called INSTC, if you have heard about it. I will show you the map, just a second. So here in this map, you can see the INSTC project. So here the project says that we will build a route through which India and Russia will be connected through this map. For example, India will be connected to Iran, then to Azerbaijan, then to Russia. Through this route, we can have a good trade with Russia directly. Right now, we do not have any passage as such. But if I, if I am talking about the present reality, right now we do not have much logistical infrastructure available to go ahead with such initiatives. Okay. Now, then there is problem with these sanctions and financial barriers. You see, you will say sanctions are there on Russia, not India. But sanctions clearly say that any country or any company who will trade with Russia, who will do, who will, who wants to trade with Russia, they cannot make use of the mechanisms that are there available with Western countries. So I talked about the SWIFT mechanism. Similarly, whenever you try to trade with Russia, US will put some pressure, Europe will put some pressure on India that you should not go ahead with that. So many a times India has to sustain that pressure to go ahead with such things. Then there is angle of technological and educational cooperation. You look at US-India relationship and then compare it with India-Russia relationship. You will find that when it comes to education, when it comes to technology, to some extent, we are still facing problems when it comes to cooperation. So overall, if India-Russia relations, you want that these relationships should grow, we need to focus on all these angles, we need to tackle all these challenges. So if I have to provide some solution in the form of way forward, what can India do, what India and Russia can do to build this uh, relationship? First of all, you need to build an institutional framework. We said we don't have any payment mechanism right now to directly trade with Russia. So first of all, India can move ahead with a stable and new payment mechanism through which India-Russia can trade easily. Or you can say, you can ask for Russia to bring some banks, open some Russian banks in India through which the transactions can take place directly. There is one other option. If you do not make use of United States dollars, make use of Indian rupees or Russian currency, then also you can directly bypass the SWIFT mechanism. So moreover, we are talking about building some infrastructure which will allow us to have that connection. Then we can have investment protection agreement. See, in Russia what happened, suddenly after the Russia-Ukraine war which was started, suddenly we observed that many countries who had some investment in Russia, they suddenly said, we are not going to have this investment. We are removing our shops and everything from Russia. So there is need of some investment protection agreement that in case of any problem, in case of any conflict, we and our investment will be protected. For that, an agreement has to be taken place between these two countries. That is very important. There should be some arbitration system also. Arbitration means if there is a problem, let's say there is a company which has brought some investment in India. And something happened, some issue happened because of which they they have, they want to go to court or they don't want to go ahead with that investment. So to solve such issues, you need to have some alternative judicial mechanism, which we call as arbitration system. That is highly important. Okay. Then before moving ahead, let's check some comments. So what if Russia and China work together? To pressurize India using Pakistan as proxy, given that India is moving close to United States, Russia's rival. 
So Varun is saying, if Russia and China work together, they are anyway working together, first of all. But they pressurize together, try to pressurize India using Pakistan as a proxy. See, China would be interested in doing this. Russia will not be interested in doing this. Russia has no bad relations with India. Please understand. We have a decent relationship and that's why Russia will not be interested in doing this particular act for now. Okay. Then, sir, why should India prefer Russia over USA? Now, why should India prefer Russia over USA? The simple answer could come from this Galwan clash which took place with China. If you remember... United States of America did not come to help. It was little bit help which, which we uh, tried to uh, take from Russia. Even the talks which took place between China and India, those were led by Russia. So to some extent, Russia is our partner. And if you understand the geopolitics, there is a saying in geopolitics since ancient times. Uh, if you remember Kautilya in his book, Artha Shastra, he says that your neighbor is your enemy and your neighbor's neighbor is your friend. So simply India's neighbor is China and China's neighbor is Russia. So naturally Russia becomes a good partner for us. This is the realistic uh, international politics. Uh, in, in theoretical terms they say that real politics always prefers such natural allies. So simply India that's why prefers Russia. Why over USA? Because it is very difficult to trust on USA. Because many a times USA uh, goes ahead with policy which is having some hidden agenda. So we have to think about it. Santosh Reddy is asking, sir, what is multipolarity? Simply, the term polarity, if you understand, pole. Do you know poles? In your school playground, there must be a pole. So there is one pole over here, one pole over here. Let's say there are 100 people sitting here. Suddenly you saw that there is a fire over here. So, let's say 40 people go on this side, 60 people go on this side. So, we are saying some people are in the pole A, some people are on the side of pole B. So, here there are two poles. So, we are calling it bipolar. So, when we talked about 1945, we said that there were two countries who were superpower, USA and USSR. That was bipolarity. That was bipolarity. And if... There is only one pole, there is only one superpower, that was USA. That is called unipolarity, single superpower is there. And if the world is run in such a manner that there is no one superpower or two superpower, there are multiple poles, multiple superpowers. USA is also powerful, Russia is powerful, China powerful, India powerful. So many countries are there who have become powerful. In that case, it is multipolarity. Multiple countries, multiple poles have got developed. That is multipolarity. Okay. Then sir, what is leading to the power shift from western countries to Asian countries? That's what we are discussing now. What is leading? What, why this is happening? Why this is happening? Simply because the entire economic structures are changing. We said now for what happened? USA was powerful. Suddenly we saw global financial crisis taking place. Due to which US economy, which was growing in a good manner, suddenly saw some recession. Right? But at the same time, that means USA, which was very powerful, it started becoming less powerful. And parallelly, the countries which were smaller, they started becoming larger. When it comes to China or India, you can say this, that their economy is growing. That too with a very good pace. In case of India, you see usually 8% growth rate. This is not the case with USA or China or, or maybe any other country you say. So this is a very good growth rate. So your in economy is increasing. When your economic size increases, you put that money in your military, in your te technologies, all other stuffs. So you become more powerful. So simply because other countries have become powerful, this is leading to this geopolitical shift. Okay. And in, in which currency does India and Russia trade take place? See, the international trade usually is taking place in the US dollar. That is considered to be international currency. But there can be a trade in which you can use your local currencies. But for that, for that, you should have a stable currency. Why would Russia be more interested in uh, buying things using Indian rupees? Because see, if they buy something 
let's say let's say they they have sold you something and you gave them indian rupee what will they do with it whatever products they need that cannot be bought through rupees they need dollars so simply it depends on the importance of your currency demand of your currency okay now let's move ahead so we talked about institutional framework another side where we can actually work that is technological collaboration already we are having collaborations but we can increase it specifically in some of the sectors such as renewable energy space exploration and digital technologies please understand nowadays we are talking about these things again and again renewable energy any way the world is going to transition towards renewable energy we cannot be dependent on oil or natural gas so this is very important and so in such sectors there can be collaboration and we can have joint manufacturing we said that russia has its own make in russia plan we have make in india plan if we come together wherein we are manufacturing a product in a joint manner then both countries can benefit so this is how we can find a solution then there is angle of logistics we talked about instc project india needs to go ahead with more talks to build this instc project that project can really help us and secondly we can also think about some alternative route so once uh, prime minister modi had visited russia specifically the far east region of russia so if you look at the russian map russia is very big so let's say this is russia i'm talking about the far eastern region of russia now this region is very interesting this region has not been explored by russia till now you can imagine this region just like our chatisgarh or north northeastern part of india where there are so many minerals so here there is a chance of getting so many minerals but the point is nobody has explored it so indian government said that we will going to explore we will put some investment in this region and there was a saying that there is a region called ladi vostok over here so government of india thought that we can have a sea route from ladi vostok to india directly so if we build such routes we can say that this logistical problem can be solved and india russia relations specifically in terms of trade can be increased exponentially okay so that's this this is the map i've already shown you now apart from that we talked about the issues related to educational and cultural exchanges now one thing about india us relationship is that we have people to people relations many people in india have relations with the people living in usa and that builds our relationship when it comes to russia we don't have people to people relations rather we have government to government relations so indian government likes russian government this is not the case with us government okay so this we can actually build up in case of russia we can ensure that our cultural exchanges take place our people go there their people come here tourists come so there will be exchange and this will build our relationship in a very good manner then some economic engagement which goes beyond the sectors which we have focused till now we focused more on defense we focused more on the energy or oil now there is a need of integrating our economies diversifying them and going beyond these two sectors only so if we do all of these we can say india russia relationship will be really good next interesting topic that we actually picked up today so the next topic that we'll be discussing here is i'm sorry for the yeah so the next topic that we'll be discussing about here is a rice variety to curb farm fire okay so off late you know as such pollution becomes very very important for your examination so even when you are reading the newspapers you need to first have a detailed or a thorough hang of the syllabus okay so in syllabus do you have pollution or it is actually given in the name of biodegradation or conservation okay so this particular topic becomes important that is pollution different types of pollution air pollution water pollution you know river pollution etc so this topic is important so when it actually talks about a rice variety to curb farm fires so what do you mean by farm fires there are actually it ultimately results in what pollution that is air pollution 
So they are actually talking about a rice variety that could that could actually stop or it could actually prevent these farm fires. Okay. So here there are number of related things that become important. First thing, the cropping pattern. The crops and cropping pattern of India becomes important. First thing. Okay. Next one, crop diversification becomes important. This is all mentioned in your syllabus. Then you have environmental degradation. That again becomes important for your examination. That is environmental pollution and degradation. Finally, conservation becomes important. So with respect to this, all these topics you actually need to know. So here we'll be talking about two rice varieties where the current one is nothing but Kosa 44 that is actually being cultivated or grown by the farmers and how it actually leads to or what are the kind of environmental challenge it actually poses due to which Kosa 2090 that is 2090 is preferred and it is actually said to be environmentally sustainable continue I mean compared to that of the former is what we are going to discuss about and in this discussion itself we'll be talking about other important things that is we'll make passing references and what is your takeaway from this discussion will be to read in detail about the topics that i make passing references okay the most important thing i'll discuss in detail particularly what the news caters to the other things which i tell you is your takeaway where you need to make notes of them and be prepared. So in this particular topic, Kusa 44 rice variety will be spoken of, 2090 variety will be spoken of and this issue of stubble burning is what you need to actually prepare because it's a very very important topic and it is a static one also and also this particular topic becomes important for your general issues on climate change and for the mains examination you need major crops cropping patterns in various parts of the country conservation, environmental pollution and degradation, okay. So, this is important for discussion for our examination. Now, moving forward, there has been a previous year question with respect to that of among the following, which actually is the largest exporter of rice in the world, whether it's China, India, Myanmar and Vietnam. Very, very important. Most of us would not have thought about India itself over here. We would have thought about China. So, here it is important that you actually you know, have your PYQs while, uh, you know, dealing with one particular topic. So, this was a question asked in the 2018 prelims examination. Now, let us see what is this particular article talking about. So, this particular article, it actually focuses on the introduction of Kusa 2090 rice variety. I already told you as against Kusa 44 variety. Why? In the context of addressing the environmental issues which is associated with stubble burning in India. Stubble burning has actually, uh, you know, uh, it is posing a lot of health risk as well as the menace of uh, air pollution across the regions of, um, what to say, Punjab, Haryana, Delhi, etc. Okay, because of late we've been hearing a lot of CAQM, air quality index, deteriorating air quality, lung diseases associated, etc. So here, they are saying in what way 2090 rice variety is actually better than that of 44. So this is what we'll actually be discussing here. So moving forward. Yeah. So first of all, we'll understand about the PUSA 44 that has actually been in cultivation. See, it was actually released in the year 1993. And since then, this has actually been, you know, a popular choice among the farmers. You need to know which is the organization that developed it. It is Indian Agricultural Research Institute that is IARI. Okay. So here, you know, it's since 1993, since its introduction by the IARI, this particular rice variety has been highly in demand and it has actually been the, you know, go-to rice variety. Next one, the yield statistics, if you see how much it actually yields is that per acre, this Posa 44 has the capacity of, you know, yielding about 35 to 36 quintals of grain per acre, okay. And in some cases, it can go up to 40 quintals also. So, this actually makes it very favorable for the farmers as well as economical also in the region of Punjab. Next, if you see profitability, this actually yields a profit of around 8,920 to 11,600 per acre. And this actually makes this most economically viable option 
particularly compared to that of the other rice variety that is PR126. Okay. So now moving forward, let us see this is actually the PUSA variety that is PUSA44 that we, we are actually speaking about. Now moving forward, we will actually see what are all the concerns, okay? So this, though this particular rice variety is economical, it is highly profitable, it actually has certain, uh, you know, concerns such as extending growing period. It actually has the environmental costs. There are a lot of health risks associated, the higher amount of water consumption during irrigation. Despite government efforts, we are not able to curb it. Why is what we'll actually have to see here. So extended growing period, here I'll make it very simple. If you see this PUSA 44, this actually takes around 155 to 160 days. That is the seed to grain period. That is nothing but the amount of time this particular rice variety takes to mature is around 155 to 160, okay? So what happens is that since it is actually a longer duration of time, there is a lot of time crunch on the farmers because they need to clear up their fields for sowing of wheat and cultivation and get it ready for the winter season, right? So what happens is that uh, since this is actually hampering it, the it is actually causing one minute. Since this period actually causes a lot of crunch, what happens is that the farmers actually resort to stubble burning in order to clear their fields, okay? So that is why stubble burning, then environmental pollution, global warming, so on continues, okay? So here, PUSA 44, this actually takes 155 to 160 days and this uh, is a time of maturity. This is 30 to 35 days longer than the other varieties and hence it actually leads to stubble burning. So due to stubble burning, it actually spreads to the neighboring regions and hence it actually has health concern and also farmer dependence is there. Despite, you know, having this environmental cause, the farmers continue to grow because of their higher yield and in 2022 if you see it covered 15.4% of Punjab's non-Basmati rice acreage although its share has been declining gradually as PR 126 grains popularity. Next what happened government of Punjab has actually banned it but then what happens due to the lack of alternatives they still resort to growing this particular variety of rice. Now moving forward, PUSAP 2090, which is actually seen as a viable alternative. The same organization that is Agricultural Research Institute has developed this new variety as a direct replacement to the other variety that is this PUSA 44 and it actually what to say it is it actually grows in a very very short span that is the amount of time that is taken is only 120 to 125 days that is 30 days lesser than that of the previous variety. Also similar yield, this PUSA 290's grain yield, it actually gives around 34 to 35 quintals per acre is almost comparable to 44 while still it actually offers other benefits like higher head rice recovery that is 68 to 70 percent and mild aromatic grains and also this particular PUSA 2090 is actually highly lodging resistant. What do you mean by lodging? Lodging is actually the bending down of the you know crop like this due to any kind of wind or rain or during adverse climatic conditions where you actually see this particular PUSA 2090 is lodging resistant also okay so it actually is acts as a robust option during grain filling as well as ripening stages. So this is actually PUSA 2090 where you see comparatively it is lodging resistant also while at the same time it produces almost the same kind of results. What are the other benefits that this particular rice variety gives is that first one saving of water okay so since it actually matures 35 days earlier with the uh, you know what to say with the higher yields also and profitability also it is significant it has significant water savings requiring around five to six fewer irrigation so you know water scarcity is actually being prevented so prevention of water scarcity is there next one sustainability also because here they actually do not uh, first thing is that the farmers don't go for stubble burning because they have ample time for their wheat as well as there is sufficient groundwater left even after irrigation. This is related to India's nuclear energy. Now see, we have energy security. We have energy sector. 
Now, most of the students do not know what is energy. When I am using the term energy, it simply means either the power or fuel that we are going to use. For example, for every modern activity, we need some kind of a fuel or power. Let's say here I am teaching you. For that, there is some camera. For that, there are some lights. For that, we have the smart board. This smart board works because there is electrical supply to it. That electricity is providing the power or providing the energy which is required for this board to work. Now, not just this board. If you want to go from one place to another, you use your bikes, you use your vehicles. Those vehicles are mechanical devices which are operating on the crude oil or the petrol diesel. Now, these petrol diesel, when they burn, they generate some kind of an energy. So, whether you look at this mechanical energy, whether you look at the energy that is there in the form of electricity, all of this comes into picture. All of this is what we are talking about when we are using this term energy. Now, just imagine, do you think our economy, our modern lifestyle can continue without this energy? No, obviously, we need energy. So, we have different sources of gaining energy. One of that source is the nuclear source or we make use of nuclear power plants from which we generate electricity. So, here specifically we are going to discuss this part, the nuclear energy as part of our economy, as part of our energy generation process. Now, this is important for mains as well as prelims. Some factual part will be there which can be important for prelims but specifically for mains. Now, look at this previous year question. It says, with growing energy needs, should India keep on expanding its nuclear energy program? Discuss the facts and fears associated with nuclear energy. So, very direct, straightforward question. Should India go ahead with expanding its nuclear energy program? But for that, you first need to know what is the nuclear energy program, what, what is the stage in which we are actually right now, how much energy we are getting from the nuclear energy part. All this fact you first need to know. Then they have asked about the fears also. That means what kind of challenges there can be. All of this if you know only then you can write this answer. Okay. So let's discuss the article. Now what has recently happened? Recently, government of India has said that we are going to expand our nuclear energy sector. Our plan is that Till now, we were focusing only on the government sector. We said that this nuclear energy is very important and it will be more, more or less controlled by the government only. There is no role of private sector. And now government is saying that we are thinking we can bring in private sector and making use of this private sector in the nuclear energy. So this is something new that is happening. So recently when even the budget, when budget speech came, in that budget speech also, Nirmala Sita Raman specifically talked about small modular reactors, the design or the research and development part of that small modular reactors will be done by the private sector. This is what she said. That means government is bringing some kind of a new reform in this. Okay. Now, what is the small modular reactor? We'll understand. But right now, just focus on the part of energy. Now, as far as India is concerned, the energy which we are getting, whether in mechanical form, through oil, through, through crude oil or natural gas, or whether we are getting from any power plant. There are multiple kinds of power plant, thermal power plant, hydro power plant. Most of the things, if we are just combining everything together, all of this energy, then we can look at the data from which source we are getting maximum energy or the lesser energy. Now, look at this. We are getting 56%. This is data for India and this we have taken from Ministry of Power. So, 56% of the overall energy is coming from fossil fuels. Now, when I say fossil fuels, it includes your crude oil, it includes your petroleum products, it includes your natural gas, all those things. Apart from that, we have some renewable energy sources. So, if you look at the solar energy, that energy is coming from sun directly. And it is renewable. You can renew it. See, if you are using any fossil fuel, let's say you are using oil, there is a limit of oil. Na? You can you can come up with oil, but at one point of time, this oil will completely be extracted and there will not be any kind of oil left. Or if I have to give another example, 
द मेजर सोर्स ऑफ एनर्जी इन इंडिया राइट नाउ स्पेशली इफ यू आर जनरेटिंग इलेक्ट्रिसिटी मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ आवर इलेक्ट्रिसिटी कम्स फ्रॉम थर्मल पावर प्लांट यूज कोल नाउ कोल इज ऑल्सो अ फॉसिल फ्यूल नाउ दिस कोल वेन यू आर यूजिंग वॉट दे सिंपली डू इज दैट दे बर्न द कोल एंड आफ्टर बर्निंग द कोल सम वॉटर इज देयर that water starts boiling and some heat comes up some steam comes up that steam that steam leads to rotation of a device called turbine so steam will come and it will rotate the turbine if you want to just generate electricity the best way is this device you use it and just rotate it now this is not a normal device you cannot rotate it with your hands you need power you need energy and when you have immense quantity of coal from which you are getting immense quantity of steam from there you can go ahead with just rotating this turbine from which you will get the electricity now i am saying even the coal there is a limitation how much coal you can extract from uh, doing the mining there is a limitation this source is not renewable but if you look at the solar energy the energy you are getting from sun it is not limited the energy will keep on coming so this is a renewable source or even you are using the wind energy that is also renewable source so right now india when when we are talking about the entire energy source 41% is coming from renewable energy this is the recent data and now the specific part which we are going to deal is the nuclear energy we are only getting our energy only 3% of that energy is coming from the nuclear energy that is the nuclear power plants that means certainly we are not gaining much but that's why we are discussing it that nuclear energy is a good source it is considered to be a very clean source why because when you are using let's say coal which is a, which is a fossil fuel what happens is that when you burn the coal or when you burn this oil the petrol or diesel you see some kinds of some kind of pollution so carbon dioxide carbon monoxide many greenhouse gases they will become part of your atmosphere which is not good for you obviously now that's why you said that the global warming is taking place so instead of using fossil fuels we'll use renewable sources but there are some limitations with the renewable sources let's say you want to make use of solar panels but is it possible to use solar panels everywhere let's say today you have decent light over here but maybe tomorrow it is raining continuously in the monsoon period or maybe you are living in an area where the sunlight is very less very scarce in that region can you use it so there are some limitations when it comes to these renewable sources but nuclear energy is very unique if you are using nuclear energy if you have a nuclear power plant from there first of all you will get immense quantity of electricity the volume will be very large and second thing is that it is considered to be a very clean energy that means you are not getting any kind of pollution any kind of carbon dioxide etc from a nuclear power plant so it is considered to be a very good solution and right now the demand for electricity is continuously increasing so we are looking at nuclear energy as one of the best solutions for us okay now let's move ahead let's look at what is specifically this nuclear energy so you must have heard about nucleus you must have heard about atoms that anything that exist in physical form it is made of atom right if you are let's say even this pen which we have if i zoom if i check the smallest unit from which this pen has been made that smallest unit smallest unit is the atom for any substance you will find that now if you zoom the atom let's say this is an atom there is a nucleus in that atom right now if we have this one atom when we have another atom and the nucleus of atom 1 interacts with nucleus of atom 2 if there is an interaction some kind of interaction okay that reaction leads to immense energy let's say if i combine these two atoms these nucleus are combined this leads to generation of energy which we cannot even imagine so just imagine just imagine the nuclear bomb 
when when uh, USA used nuclear bomb on Japan, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, you must have heard about it. That bomb was making use of the same technology, wherein two nucleus two nucleus were combined or or they were there are two methods. One either you are combining or you can split it. So USA had used the similar mechanism or even any nuclear bomb you will have this kind of mechanism. Now let me tell you there is a difference. There is a term called nuclear fission and there is a term called nuclear fusion. This is very important for you to understand how nuclear reaction actually takes place. Now simply let's say we have taken a nuclear one one atom which is nuclear fissile or we can say which can generate electric energy not electricity energy so what we'll do we'll take one big large heavy atom now this is we can say let's say we have taken plutonium okay or you can take even uranium now if you take the atom of this plutonium or uranium they are very heavy they are very dense and they are larger in size here you can see and now if i divide now this atom will have one nucleus if i divide this nucleus if i divide this entire atom into two parts which is not an easy task scientists will do something very interesting to do this but once it is divided it is split into two different parts so there will be atom 1 atom 2 there will be two different nucleus and this reaction will generate immense amount of energy. Now after some time what you will do? You will divide this nucleus into two, this into two, this will be divided into two, this will be divided into two. This is how a chain reaction will continue. That means this reaction will not stop. This is the reason you see this nuclear reaction continuing. So this will lead to a big blast. This is you can this is what you can actually imagine. This reaction we are calling nuclear fission. You are splitting it into two parts. This is nuclear fission. Not just two, you can even go for four, six, maybe more than that. This is nuclear fission. Now, the nuclear power plants that we have in India or even in other countries too, most of these nuclear power plants are using this same reaction, nuclear fission. This is how they are generating electricity or power. So, simply, Immense energy will be generated. Again, there will be water which will be heated up, steam will come out and turbine will be rotated. So, remaining mechanism is similar. But we need that heating, we need that energy which is coming from nuclear fusion. Now, there is another reaction that is nuclear fusion. Fusion, what we will do? We will take two smaller, less dense, less, pow less powerful than this one these two atoms and we will combine the nucleus of these two forming one single nucleus. Now this is also very difficult and if we do that, if we are combining it, this will also generate immense energy and this is called nuclear fusion. Now right now in our power plants, we are not using this technology but this technology is there in the sun, in the nucleus of sun. So if you look at sun, Nucleus, it's, it's uh, corona and all those parts. Continuously, nucleus fusion is taking place on sun. That is why you are getting so much heat from sun. We are at a very far distance from sun. Still, we are getting that energy. So, you can imagine what kind of energy can be generated from nuclear fusion. Now, right now, many scientists are working. Many countries have come together and they are planning that we will make use of nuclear fusion in power plant. This is very tough right now. And this project is right now named as ITER. Many countries are involved in this. If this project becomes successful, we can say that the electricity problem from the world will be completely resolved because you will get immense energy. So you will have continuous electricity supply. Clear? So you have understood what is nuclear energy, what is nuclear fission, what is nuclear fusion. Now as far as your nuclear bombs or atomic bombs are concerned, you can make use of both technologies in those atomic bombs. For example, the Hiroshima Nagasaki bomb, they made use of nuclear fission. 
but in case of hydrogen bomb you can make use of fusion okay now let's move ahead please if you have any question please ask now this nuclear energy is there now we want to make use of this nuclear energy especially for our electricity generation okay now here in india we have some legal framework we have two different laws those laws are very important when it comes to nuclear energy first of all please understand if this nuclear energy if someone is controlling it apart from government let's say a private person a normal person he gets the access of nuclear energy who can generate such a large quantity of energy in just one second one microsecond he or she can destroy the entire city in few seconds so do you want this energy to be there in the hands of a private person that is highly risky especially not in the hands of terrorists so in india we have this law atomic energy act 1962 now at that time government was very clear that we will not give access to private sector we will control it so this act specifically section 3a of this act it clearly mentions that only the central government will be producing developing using and disposing atomic energy that means the power is not even there with the state governments only central government has the power whether they want to produce it develop it use it whatever they want to do they can do it now to do it not central government means not directly prime minister will not be doing it obviously there will be some agency so they will have some agencies for example in the central government you have department of atomic energy a special department has been made this department does not report to any ministry rather they directly report to the prime minister's office so very interesting very autonomous kind of institution we can say relatively and we have this some public sector units or some companies which are directly working for example nuclear power corporation of india limited npcil so central government will make use of these agencies to produce nuclear energy to build that nuclear power plant and just go ahead with generation of electricity using nuclear energy clear so one thing we understand here we do not see much role of private sector right government is controlling specifically central government now after some time we saw one case sandeep ts versus union of india and others in this case supreme court made some clarifications supreme court said that it is not that private sector will not have any access they will have access they can work in the field of nuclear energy but only in the non critical sectors now what does this mean this means in case government is building a power plant let's say npcil is building a new power plant which is going to generate electricity using nuclear energy in that case there will be some tasks which can be done by private sector and that will not give them access of nuclear energy directly for example for building the infrastructure of nuclear uh, power plant they can make use of a private sector company for the design purpose they can make use of them so government is not directly giving them access to that nuclear energy or uranium or plutonium just for other not so important not so critical tasks they are making use of this private sector so this was said by supreme court that in these non critical sectors you are allowed to act but when it comes to the core part core work you have no access it will be controlled by the central government only clear so this act is important now there is another act civil liability for nuclear damage act 2010 now this is important because this act came into picture at the time of us india nuclear deal see if you remember when pokhran 2 test was carried out in the leadership with the leadership of uh, atal bihari vajpayee ji at that time many countries put sanctions on india just like right now we are seeing sanctions on russia on iran on north korea similar kinds of sanctions were put on india also after which indian government diplomatically engaged with many countries specifically united states of america and at the time of manmohan singh ji we saw an agreement taking place which is civil nuclear deal so at that time 
it was very clear that india needs to have some domestic law in india there must be some law related to nuclear damages let's say in case a foreign company let's say a company from usa invest some amount of money or some capital in the nuclear sector of india or they are providing some nuclear sources let's say we need uranium or something related to nuclear energy from usa we are getting that so the supplier is from usa so here in india if we do not have any specific law which gives some clarifications related to any kind of accident let's say suddenly there is an accident in that nuclear power plant so who will pay for it because of the accident let's say many people died some uh, a lot of damage has taken place now who will pay who will pay the compensation whether the government will pay whether this company from usa will pay or the company in india which was operator which was operating everything let's say npcil that company will pay there should be some clarity in your laws so usa pressurized so after that india came up with this law this is the law civil liability for nuclear damage act 2010 Now, what this act specifically says? Look, here are three members. First, you have an operator. Operator, for example, NPCIL, who is operating this nuclear power plant, who is taking care of almost everything. Okay, you have someone coming from USA. Let's say you can call them supplier. Okay, they are providing something. They are supplying something to this operator. Let's say some devices they are giving, some nuclear uh, fissile material they are giving, anything they can provide. Some material is coming from them. Operation is done. Everything is done by NPCIL, right? Now here, when these two entities are involved, and third will be your people who will be affected by whatever these people are going to do. Now let's say they built a power plant. After some time, we saw a big disaster. the nuclear power plant exploded and the entire city got vanished entire city got destroyed now the question is who will pay the compensation who will pay for those damages the act clearly mentioned that the sole responsibility of paying the compensation lies on this operator because the operator is the sole responsible uh, responsible entity so operator will have to pay now there is a chance that because of nuclear power see nuclear power is very dangerous so there is a chance that the destruction is so vast that even this company is not capable of paying that much amount so what government did they provided a cap they said that to a certain limit company will pay if the amount goes beyond that in that case government will pay for it so government said we are bringing a fund a specific fund and we will allocate amount from that fund so responsibility was clear that it will be for the operator only now look at the things from us's perspective us will be very happy that uh, even if we are investing and if something goes wrong we don't need to pay only operator will pay and even if you look at many international conventions they also mention that the responsibility should be there only with the operator for such damages or accidents and not with the supplier okay but now there is an interesting thing if you look at this particular act it says that even if the responsibility lies on this operator he the operator will have to pay for that moment but later on after inquiry if this operator feels that this incident this accident took place not because of our mistake but because of the mistakes done by this supplier the supplier the usa supplier provided us a damaged product a wrong product and because of that product or that material we saw this accident taking place that means our other uh, there was no mistake from our side it was the mistake from the supplier side so what will happen according to this law first operator will pay but later on operator can go for right to recourse that means they can ask for that compensation from that company of usa so this is the clause which is very interesting this is the clause which is highly debated so most important point is we said that in most of the international conventions the responsibility has been put only on the operator and not on the supplier but indian government 
brought the law wherein they have put responsibility on both sides and here now just look at this thing if us is helping us build a nuclear power plant and later on something goes wrong there is a chance that usa will have to pay back the amount so do you think investor will be much interested in going ahead with such kind of investments no so this is something highly debated when it comes to india us relations or when it comes to any kind of civil nuclear deal and I, i was saying that there are many conventions which are mentioning that only operators should be responsible the example is this vienna convention on civil liability for nuclear damage 1963 then paris convention on third party liability in the field of nuclear energy 1960 so these are good examples for you to study clear now moving ahead if you have understood this framework now i am saying that right now government is saying now we need to think to reform things we need investment we need our energy sector to grow why because right now we have a very high energy demand our population is increasing our economy is growing we need energy for that we need nuclear energy we need more investment we have some commitments to decarbonization so you must have heard about paris climate agreement and all we have made some commitments to the international community that we are going to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions we are going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and to do that you have to shift transition from this fossil fuel based economy to the renewable one and it is not easy to transition and nuclear energy can be one of the best solutions to go ahead with it and if we want to modernize our nuclear energy infrastructure for all of this government of india thinks that we need nuclear power plants maybe we need to make some changes in our laws now then niti ayog also came into picture niti ayog said that so we actually need private sector involvement we need to increase their role because if you put all the responsibility only on the government this is not going to work and india also has a target right now we i i provided you the data that only 3% of energy is coming from the nuclear energy sources or nuclear power plants india has set a target that we will increase it to 9 to 10% this is the target and obviously to achieve it we need investment so we are saying what we can do is that if you do not want to rely completely on the private sector go with some joint venture go with some ppp kind of model public private investment public private partnership wherein some work will be done by npcil and some work will be done by the private sector and don't give them access to that core roles give them the access to only these non critical areas so if we do this we can go ahead with it so there was one report also from niti ayog and this dme department of military engineering they said that sir we can come up with the idea of small modular reactors now this is very important what is small modular reactor normally if you look at a power plant nuclear power plant this will look like this bigger in size very large and you will get immense uh, energy immense electricity from this but to build this plant you will require lot of capital lot of investment you will require lot of time and the process itself is very complicated so a new suggestion came into picture which said that instead of building this traditional big nuclear power plant let's build some small power plants and these are something we are calling as small modular reactors so you can say a small kind of a very small nuclear power plant obviously you will require less capital it will be very flexible you don't need to build it uh, at the same location you can build it in your manufacturing power plant and then transport it to the location where you want it to be transported so such such smaller modular reactors can be generated and see if any disaster takes place let's say this big nuclear power plant some kind of a disaster took place just like chernobyl in that case there will be very high destruction but in case there is some kind of a destruction due to a small modular reactor the impact will be very less so we are saying this one is very safe relatively safer and better option and what india can do the research and development part of this small modular reactor the designing part all of this can be done by the private sector so recently when budget speech was there 
in that speech it was announced that we are going to build bharat small reactors bharat small modular reactors and we are going to work on nuclear energy technologies making use of the private sector so this is the entire story i hope you understand how private sector's role is increasing in this nuclear energy clear now let me check if you have any kind of doubt so what are the major side effects of nuclear disasters the first side effect is that many people many animals will die directly simply because when a nuclear reaction of a large scale is taking place you can watch that movie called chernobyl a movie or web series i don't know you can watch it to understand what kind of an impact you can see suddenly the entire city may get devastated it's just it's not just about that people will die you will see that the radiation will go on the radiation will stay there even the land which you have let's say you have a farm you have an agricultural land because of that nuclear radiation you will see that the land will become useless for centuries even if people have not died some people uh, did not die but because of radiation there will be some changes in their genetics when they will give birth to another child the child will have some kind of deformities so nuclear disaster will have so many effects so many effects okay so we 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 do not want to see any such thing happen okay now we have understood the scope of private sector now we are moving ahead with the challenges what kind of challenges we already know these things i'll i'll just tell you in brief first issue lies with this liability concern in that act we said that there will be liability on the supplier that's why the the investors from foreign countries they'll say that we don't want to invest we don't want to go ahead with it so if nobody will invest how are you going to build our our small modular reactors or even the traditional nuclear power plants so this is a concern okay second is the issue with the regulation now this is an administration problem what happens is that disasters usually take place because of some kind of error from our side and the error takes place because of lack of accountability lack of transparency when everything is not known to the larger public when the transparency is not there something may happen so we are saying there should be transparency but transparency will only be there if the institution who is regulating is very much powerful is very much autonomous it does not depend on the government it is completely autonomous just like our supreme court or election commission of india here in case of india what is happening we have this regulatory body atomic energy regulatory board now this board directly works under the department of atomic energy the same department which directly reports to prime minister's office so we are seeing you are anyway under the government so how can we expect you to be highly transparent highly autonomous it is not at all possible so there were talks going on that we need an independent regulator so after some time in the parliament when bill came nuclear safety regulatory authority nsra now this bill said that we will bring an independent regulator but what happened the bill did not pass it is still pending this is a big problem for us next challenge lies in the capital cost to build a nuclear power plant you need investment a very high cost has to be paid and it is not like any other business normally what happens when an investor is investing some amount he expects that the return should come in future as early as possible let's say i'm putting 1000 crore in something i'll expect within 6 months i should get my money back i should get the profit but in case of nuclear power plants if you're building a traditional nuclear power power plant the process itself takes so much time maybe it will take 3 years 4 years 5 years to build this entire plant after which it will start working after which your electricity will be generated and sold and then some money will come so the investors think that the gestation period is very long i don't want to invest in this so this is a big concern when it comes to private sector then there is issue of public perception public has observed the incident of chernobyl public has seen that such events can ca cause catastrophe and right now many environmental activists whenever you you say that we want to bring any nuclear power plant over here 
the environmental activists will simply say we don't want it. Why? Because the catastrophe can be very dangerous. So if you want that private sector's role should increase, first of all, you need to ensure that the public perception is positive towards these power plants. If it is negative, you cannot, cannot allow even private sector to build a plant. There will be protests, there will be problems. And at last, there should be some clarity on the policy side. Government sometimes says we will bring a regulator. Later on, the bill stays as it is. It is pending in the parliament. Government sometimes says that we are going to have a law which is investment friendly. But later on, government says no, the damage should, for the damages, the supplier will have to pay. So there is no clarity. So government needs to come up with some policy which gives clarity about everything. Investor needs clarity only when the investor will invest. So these are the challenges private sector is going to face when it comes to investing in the nuclear energy part. So as a way forward, whenever you are telling some challenges, you have to provide some solutions too. So few solutions could be address this issue of liability concern. Either government should discuss with these suppliers, negotiate and then come up with some solution, address it. Either there should be some insurance mechanism that in case any kind of accident takes place, there will be an insurance company who will pay for it, not the supplier. Supplier will just pay some premium for those insurance. Such mechanism can be there. Then some regulatory reforms. For example, you can bring this bill. You can bring it. You can bring an independent authority who is going to regulate. So even the investor will trust your mechanism. Then you can go for public-private partnership. Why? Because you don't want to completely rely on the private sector. You don't want to give almost everything in the hand of private sector. So go ahead with public-private partnership. And for the private sector to come in, you have to give them some incentives, give them some tax holidays, some subsidies, something if you provide them, then only they will come forward. And if the public outreach is there from the government side, if government will come up with some campaign, some educational campaign, some awareness about the power plants, then only people will also accept it. The perception will become positive. And at last, what government can additionally do is they can strengthen their international collaboration. They can go ahead with international community, come, come up with the standards which are similar to international community. In other countries also, if the similar laws exist and in India also similar laws exist, then there will not be much problem, much friction. So all of this can be done when it comes to India's nuclear sector. I hope you have got the point, what I'm trying to say. I hope now you have a clear picture about India's nuclear sector. China, Vietnam, Red Diplomacy. Though this article talks more about China and Vietnam. How China and Vietnam, uh, now these two countries have certain disputes. But these two countries are trying to, uh, you know, sort out the differences and come together, work together, collaborate on different areas and make sure both the countries or the region is growing and developing, right? So, in this article, we'll focus more on the red diplomacy, right? And you may mark this for, for prelims, GS paper 2, right? What is the context? The president of Vietnam is on a visit to China, right? The purpose is to sort out the differences and work together. This is the purpose and as a reason, the president of Vietnam is on a visit to China, right? The, the visit focus on strengthening these strategic ties, economic collaboration and shared socialist ideology, right? Now, India has remained a very, very important country for Vietnam. Which means India has tried to leverage the cultural and strategic ties with Vietnam. Which means for India, Vietnam is a very important country. Similarly, for Vietnam, India is also a very important country. Which means given the way China is trying to dominate the region, India is not happy, neither is Vietnam. So, we two countries are coming together to counterbalance the hegemony 
or heft of china in the region the way china doesn't listen to anyone china bothers less about any country they do what they feel or think is right they do not follow the international rules and this is creating problem to the other countries especially the china's neighbors so india and vietnam are also coming together to counterbalance the china's growing might this is the context now let's focus on red diplomacy now what is red diplomacy it refers to the diplomatic efforts and strategic alliances between countries that share a common ideological foundation in communism or socialism let's try to understand this term red diplomacy diplomatic efforts and strategic alliances between countries now these alliances are between countries that share common ideological foundation for example vietnam had a communist government china still has a communist government which means we know in the 18th century at the peak of industrial revolution capitalism capitalism was at its peak which means what is capitalism based on your talent innovation you produce more and make more profit no one is going to stop you so the industrialists right the owners of the company what they did is they made people work for 18 hours a day exploited them and maximized their profits this is capitalism the state will not interfere based on your innovation potential you do whatever you feel like this should actually benefit the country given that the people were suffering because of capitalism came the concept of communism communism said that in capitalism what is the key or key thing that there is greed there is greed so people want to earn more and more money more and more wealth more and more property under communism karl marx said that there will be no private property everything will belong to the community there will be no private property so in countries like china vietnam or many such country cuba where the capitalists were actually ruling or let's say one percentage of the population was ruling or the 99 percentage of the population so the common people in these countries they rose into a rebellion and fought against the monarchs or the lords and they finally actually overthrew or dismantled their government for example uh in russia we had the tsars right in china we had the qing and the ming dynasty so the common people in china vietnam they actually came together and fought against the warlords or for that matter the monarchs aristocrats and finally they established a communist government which means now there will be no private property however no country is purely communist country now in order to reach to communism from capitalism socialism what is socialism for example india adopted socialism after 1947 when india became a free country socialism says that the state and the private people the private players both would coexist but the state will dictate terms and policy which means let's say for example i am an industrialist i and i let's say i manufacture right i manufacture vehicles now the state will tell me how many vehicles i can produce or manufacture i cannot manufacture as per my understanding as per the state's policies i have to manufacture only those number of vehicles this is socialism where state actually regulates it and everything however the private people are free to use their innovation talent and see that they maximize their profits this is socialism so the step towards communism was through socialism under socialism the common people will have the control over the state resources and with time with the passage of time the state will 
desettle and everything will belong to the community however communism never came into practice what we see in major part or uh, major places of the world is socialism that is a state tries to dictate now in some countries for example us or the western countries capitalism which means there is no major control over the private players the private people are free to manufacture produce develop as per their potential facebook is an example of capitalism i have the talent i have the innovation i can create what i want to which will help the common people right so red diplomacy is a diplomatic and strategic alliance between countries that had common ideological foundation and what is that ideological foundation it is communism vietnam and china had communist governments this is known as red diplomacy it highlights the political historical and ideological ties between such states for example the relationship between china and vietnam is rooted in their shared communist ideologies which means the people in these countries the common people came together fought against the aristocrats monarchs and established the communist government in these countries this is what we understand by red diplomacy now gulf of tonkin is a disputed territory that was in the news why because china was trying to claim claim its rights over this particular region where is gulf of tonkin it is important to remember this this location right so this is the gulf of tonkin this is vietnam this is china and this is the gulf of tonkin now vietnam and china both were contesting this particular region china said it's mine vietnam said it's mine so both these countries had or still have maritime disputes in this gulf of tonkin and it's a very very important place why because the trade passes through this region right so it's a very important maritime route so please remember this gulf of tonkin and make sure that in your map you are actually marking this particular gulf of tonkin right now talking about india and vietnam now both these countries both india and vietnam the relationship are is characterized by strategic strategic economic and cultural cooperation now under the mekong ganga corporation what is mekong mekong is a river now this is a homework to you you need to find out the countries from where the mekong river passes this is your homework so the countries from where ganga and mekong river flows these countries have come together to establish mekong ganga cooperation now under this framework india has completed 45 quick impact projects in vietnam and is supporting cultural heritage restoration like the my son unesco world heritage site which means we are actually helping vietnam with respect to preserving their cultural uniqueness or cultural sites right now both these countries india and vietnam have experienced resistance against colonialism india we fought against the british government vietnam fought against the united states now there's a bloody war because of the united states intervention in vietnam thousands and lakhs of people got killed so both these countries experienced resistance against the colonial powers india fought against the british vietnam fought against the united states and both the countries have a considerable support or people supporting and following buddhism india's act east policy aims to dependize now what is india's act east policy now under india's act east policy we intend to uh, enter into partnership with the eastern countries or the south eastern countries for example vietnam laos cambodia myanmar singapore indonesia brunei Eastern countries, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea. 
which means under India's ACTIS policy, we are trying to integrate with these countries so that there is more trade, more development, more business, more welfare of the people. Right? So, under India's ACTIS policy, we are trying to establish relationship and make our relationship strong with the countries that I just mentioned. Now the two countries collaborate in areas such as defense, trade, technology and maritime security. As I told you that China and Vietnam have territorial disputes, maritime disputes. India and China also have border disputes. As China is trying to pressurize both these countries, both the countries are coming together to work with each other in defense related areas to counterbalance China's growing hegemony or power in the region. For example, in the Indo-Pacific region, right, in the Indo-Pacific region, for example, both the countries collaborate in military exercises like the Winbacks and Milan exercise. Now, this point is very, very important for your prelims examination. Please remember the name of the military exercise between India and Vietnam. It is Winbacks and Milan exercise. So, the purpose is that the militaries of both countries, they actually collaborate, they, they work together so that whenever situation comes, these two countries are efficient to fight against the enemy. This is the purpose of the military exercise, right? So, India also gifted INS Kirpan. Now, what is this? This actually is a warship. It's a warship with anti-submarine capabilities. This warship has the potential capability to destroy a submarine. And this warship is meant to protect the or to defend the coastal region. Coastal region. INS Kirpan. We gifted this to Vietnam. The point is that both the countries are working in these strategic areas like defense technology and making sure that we fight against the enemy in a far more efficient manner and the enemy should not try to take advantage of the vulnerability, right? So in this particular article, this talks about what is the status of Swatch Bharat Mission 2.0. So first you need to know what is this Swatch Bharat Mission? So, before that, let me actually see. If there are any doubts that have been asked in the session. No. So far, no questions. So, we shall actually move forward in understanding what is this Swachh Bharat mission. Okay. So, this was actually an initiative that was brought about by the government in the year. 2014 to mark the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhiji. Okay, so this actually aims at enhancing the hygiene conditions as well as the sanitation in India and also to eliminate open defecation in India. Okay, by constructing so many toilets across the country. So this is what is Swachh Bharat Mission and its um, you know submission or you can say the second version of it actually was in 2021 in order to uphold you know all these provisions till the year 2026. So this is what we will be discussing over here. So here we will be discussing what is this particular Swachh Bharat Mission. This is important because schemes are very very important in your prelims examination. At the same time what kind of implications it is actually having whether it is helping India in order to achieve or move towards its sustainable development goal. How far has India progressed when compared to the other countries the global best examples and practices become very very important for your mains examination. Okay. So here for the mains examination this particular topic becomes important under GS paper 2 government policies and interventions for the development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation. So before understanding any topic it is very important for you that you actually cram the syllabus. So that is how you can you know spot the um, certain issues on the newspaper only when you have the syllabus in your mind by heart okay. So now let us actually move on to understand this 
So before that, there has been a previous year question that was actually asked about one of the schemes that is Unnat Bharat Abhiyan. So you actually have to know that the recent schemes, implementations, targets, beneficiaries, eligibility criteria, outcomes, so far what has been, you know, the progress of India, the subcomponents, objectives, visions of the mission, all this becomes very, very important for your examination and such was actually the Unnat Bharat Abhiyan. Okay, so you need to know all these specifics. Now, moving forward, let us understand what the article is actually talking about. So, the article provides an update on how has, you know, so far, how well has this Swachh Bharat Mission 2.0 has been, um, you know, doing or progressing well in India. Also, focusing on the status of legacy waste dump sites in India. So, I think for the first time you are listening to this particular term, legacy waste dump site. So, what do you mean by legacy waste dump sites? If you actually see in certain areas, you know, you know, outskirts of the cities predominantly, you see garbage which are actually piled up in the form of hills. And this is because of, you know, uh, uncontrolled uh, dumping as well as unscientific methods, okay, because they do not know how properly to dispose them. And these accumulated hills are actually called as legacy waste dump sites. So, we'll actually look at what are legacy waste dump sites and what kind of hazards, both environmental and health hazards that these actually bring forth and how this particular legacy waste dump sites was integrated into the Swatch Bharat Mission 2.0 and how it has actually performed so far, okay? So here, what are legacy waste dump sites? So these are waste disposal sites. So they have accumulated solid waste over many years, okay? And in an unscientific as well as an uncontrolled manner, simple to understand, right? If you actually see mountains of garbage here piled up. So these are called as the legacy waste dump sites. They are essentially man-made, of course, yes, because these are all anthropogenic. And these are actually developed by the local authorities, such as you have the municipal corporations, the councils, as well as the panchayats due to the absence of proper waste handling facilities. So, since there are absence of waste handling facilities, this actually emerged, that is, legacy waste dump sites are created because it is man-made. Next one is, India has over 3,000 such dump sites with around 2,424 sites containing more than 1,000 tons of waste each. This is very important. You need to know any topic you discuss, we need to definitely discuss about what is actually the status of such sites in India. So, in India, if you see, there is actually around 3,000 legacy waste dump sites with around 2,500 sites that contain around 1,000 tons of waste each. And these dump sites developed on the outskirts of the cities are now often found within the cities, very unfortunately, due to rapid urbanization and within the country limits due to the within the city limits yeah so earlier these were so earlier these were actually you know these were found in the outskirts of the cities and currently these are in the you know city limits because to due to the rapid urbanization or uh, uh, sorry the urban expansion and they cover around 15,000 acres and hold approximately 16 crore tons of waste. So, these are just data facts. These are not that important. But you just need to know what is their status, whether it is located in India. And few examples of where it is located would also be helpful for your better understanding. Now, moving forward, what are the health and the environmental hazards that they actually cause is that they cause a number of health risks, that is, they actually release a lot of harmful gases like methane and, uh, you know, carbon dioxide also. That actually causes symptoms like nausea, uh, vomiting as well as respiratory diseases. Also, if you see people living near these sites face higher risks of, uh, you know, ailments like tuberculosis, asthma, diabetes, depression, cholera as well as malaria. And they also contribute to significant greenhouse gas emissions, particularly as we saw methane as well as carbon dioxide. This further exacerbates the menace of climate change and that actually follows, you know, the global warming, etc. Now, moving forward.
here we need to understand about swachh bharat mission and the integration of the legacy waste dump sites over here so here the central government actually launched the legacy waste management project as a part of swachh bharat mission 2.0 in the year 2021 so under this particular initiative what happens is that the government will actually uh, you know take enough steps or strategies in order to convert these dump sites into green zones so what are green zones they refer to areas where once the legacy waste dump sites okay the areas which were earlier legacy waste dump sites but now they have actually remediated okay you know undergone the process of remediation and reclaimed for environmentally sustainable purposes and what is the key objective of sbm that is swachh bharat mission 2.0 is to create garbage free cities by 2026 through the scientific management of solid waste that is you need to scientifically manage solid waste as well as this actually includes 100% source segregation you need to you know segregate the solid waste accordingly to different categories it involves door to door collection as well as processing of waste okay so this is what is swachh bharat 2.0 and this is how it actually you know aims at promoting sustainable urban sanitation it actually ensures that the urban local bodies that these continue to maintain the open defecation free status while at the same time it has to improve urban cleanliness okay so swachh bharat is what basically it aimed at open defecation and india has declared itself you know defecation free in the year 2019 so along after which the swachh bharat uh, swachh bharat mission 2.0 had actually come in place right so on alongside maintaining the odf status this also has to make sure that the urban cleanliness and sanitation systems are in place however if we actually see we are you know close to the deadline so it was it had focused on 2021 to 2026 this space of 5 years right however we are in 2024 right now so however more than half way through the time period only 471 out of the 2500 dump sites that is 19.43% of the dump sites have been completely remediated only 19% has been remediated and this is of course a huge concern for india now moving forward what has been the state wise performance with respect to these kind of dump sites is that if you see tamil nadu and gujarat they have actually been performed better of the lot so if you see tamil nadu has reclaimed the most area at around 837 acres that is 42% of the dump site area and gujarat if you see that has reclaimed around 75% that is 698 of the total 938 acres of the landfill sites have been uh, you know reclaimed okay so this is actually the best performing status now it is the simple thing to understand swachh bharat mission that i have already told you So Swachh Bharat Mission is nothing but an initiative launched on 2nd of October 2014 to mark the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi ji. It is a nationwide campaign in order to improve the sanitation as well as the cleanliness and hygiene as well as to make India open defecation free by constructing a number of toilets across the country not only to enhance this hygiene okay but to also bring a behavioral change okay. So this is what it is saying. so it was divided into two submissions one is swachh bharat mission urban that is focused on the urban areas the other one is rural focused on the rural areas and in 2019 india declared itself open defecation free having built over 100 million toilets with an emphasis on sustained cleanliness so this is what is swachh bharat mission all about so before moving on to the next topic there's an important uh, thing that i would like to tell you is how is um, you know which of the sustainable development goals actually focuses on cleanliness and sanitation becomes very important for the examination okay so it is a part of sdg 6 so this focuses on clean water and sanitation so also so over here you need to know every answer whether if it is education you need to know sdg 4 if it is no hunger you need to know sdg 2 poverty sdg 1 water and sanitation sdg 6 okay 
So climate action SDG 13. So this is how you need to remember or by heart all your sustainable development goals. Or I can actually give you a simple method where you can by heart all the uh, you know goals. Okay. So what are SDG goals? These are 17 in number. Okay. So these are universally set goals or they are the blueprint in order to achieve or you know for the betterment and the sustainable development for the future generation. Okay. So this actually has 17 goals. So how do I remember that? First one, there has to be no poverty. Okay. So first is no poverty. When there is no poverty, what happens? You actually have money. You have enough food to eat. So the second one is no hunger. Okay. So when your hunger is actually, uh, you know, done away with, what happens is that you obviously have good health and well-being okay so when the basic needs are met okay so when you have money when your food is there your health is there what happens you need to go to school right so you need to focus on quality education this is sustainable development four so in school what do they actually teach about you they what do you actually teach about what do they teach about in school is that they talk about things like gender equality so this is sdg 5 so apart from gender equality what are other reasons why a person goes to school specifically women it, you know presence of clean water hygiene standards all these things because rapid uh, dropout rates have been noted in places where there is no toilet facilities there's no clean water no sanitation you know because of menstruation there are a lot of dropouts specifically with respect to girl students okay so apart from gender quality, equality, why do you go to school? It's because of clean water and sanitation. Okay. So now clean water is done away with. Next, what you need? You need good energy, you know, in order to, you know, have a good quality of life and other things. So here there will be clean and affordable energy. So this is. SDG 7. So first of all, no poverty followed by no hunger. So when no hunger is there, you have a healthy and uh, you know good quality of life. Then you have good quality education and in school you are actually taught about gender equality. People go to school because of clean water as well as sanitation. Next one is clean and affordable energy. Okay, so this is actually SDG 7. So when there is clean, affordable energy, you successfully complete your schooling. This is just a story that I've built up for us to remember it, uh, remember it better. Okay. So when there is good schooling and other things, what do we have to do? We have, we go to a decent workplace. So decent work, when we are employed, there is economic growth. So decent work and economic growth, SDG 8. So after that, what happens? There is a culture of innovation and industries so you are working in an industry remember it like that so innovation and industry is there and then 10th one because you actually work that is women work on par with that of men what happens there are reduced inequalities so sdg 10 is reduced inequality then you have number 11 12 13 14 15 Okay, so till 10, we are done with reduced uh, inequality. So let us actually move towards 11. Okay, so 11 is nothing but after getting reduced inequality and having a good job, you are moving to a city. So what kind of a city? A sustainable city. Okay, so this is SDG 11. And after moving to a sustainable city, what do you do? There has to be, you know, responsible uh, utilization of resources. Okay. So here, responsible consumption and production. So that has to be there. And the 13th one is climate action. It's easy to remember, climate action. And after climate action, you need to take care of life under water, then life on land. So till 15, we are actually done. In order to take care of all this, we need to have peace justice and strong institutions okay so this is sdg 16 and finally 17 is you need to have a strong partnership in order to 
achieve all these goals. So these are the ways in how you know in which you need to understand and remember all the 17 sustainable development goals starting from no poverty, no hunger, then good quality of life etc. How we need to have a good partnership in order to achieve all these 17 SDGs and here with respect to Swachh Bharat Mission, with respect to cleanliness and clean water and sanitation, India is trying to achieve SDG uh, number 6 okay, by the year 2030.